A film is realized in three parts. I feel like whatever feeling a movie has comes from a bunch of preconceived ideas about the, something, the visual, the music, the, the way the actors will play the scenes. But the actual way, it, what it adds up to be, is sort of always a surprise. The filmmaker's intention, what actually makes it to the screen, and your own inference of this. But what if the movie is commenting on the act of analysis itself? One such film is 2017's Columbus. <sighs> this isn't the movies, nothing's gonna happen. My name's Casey. It's actually Cassandra, but everyone calls me Casey. Jim. Jim? Jim. With an N. Jim! Jim with an N! See, it's asymmetrical, but it's also still balanced. Thanks. For everything. Thank you. Being here. Frames within frames, empty frames, shots where characters are eclipsed by the striking architecture surrounding them and repeating visual cues. Jen? Just an in. This is the type of visual language Columbus employs to brilliant effect. Jen? The master behind such inspired work is none other than Koganada. Perhaps most recognized for his comprehensive examinations on subjects ranging from Kubrick's one-point perspective to Brazan's use of hands, and even a couple of pieces on Ozu, who undoubtedly functioned as an inspiration for the central story and formal elements at work in Columbus. For Koganada, video essays served as a way of reconnecting him with what he loved most about cinema. It allowed him to remember what it was that actually moved him. I was sort of resisting academia because it was, for me, like sort of killing the thing that I loved because I was so much dissecting it and putting it into a kind of act academic language. And I think it started with these essays, you know, just getting my hands on the, the forms of cinema and re-presenting them. Yeah, the, the opportunity to actually try to make something that engaged that was, you know, like the dream. What? Take a look at this, what do you think it is? What is most fascinating about Koganada's work is the way he urges viewers, like the characters within his film, to explore the things they love through a personal rather than purely academic lens. Like the professor, he's, he's able to pay attention for hours if he finds something interesting. So down with books long the video games? No, <laughs> not at all. The film has various scenes where tour guides lead sightseers around Columbus's architectural landmarks, feeding them platitudes of what this fountain or that building means in the grand scheme of the modernist architectural movement. Banks in the U.S. did not look like this in 1954. They were big, imposing buildings that had tellers behind bars. At one point in the film, Casey gives Jin a tour of the same bank we've seen from the previous touring scene. This was one of the first modernist banks in America. You can imagine at the time that walking into an all-glass bank was quite unusual. Radical, really. Because during that time, banks were designed to be imposing, fortress-like, with tellers behind bars. Here, her assessment merely repeats what the tour guide said before her, to which Jin responds. Do you like this building intellectually because of all the facts? No. I'm also moved by it. Yes. Yes, tell me about that. What moves you? What Koganada does here is truly brilliant. I thought you hated architecture. Uh, I do. But I'm interested in what moves you, particularly about a building. In cutting to the reverse side of the glass, we don't hear Casey's response, but we don't need to. We no longer see her reflection, but we see her. She's talking about the things she loves, and more importantly, why she loves it. Like in his video essays, Koganada manages to take something that can seem cold and academic, here architecture, and in allowing the characters to connect with it emotionally, truly find something more personal. Well, wouldn't you get tired of it? No, not at all. And I'd get to interact with all these interesting people from all over the world. 
The problem with being a tour guide is that you stop seeking. You become some arbiter of tidbit facts that you'd start repeating over and over. You'd hate it. Sometimes in talking about the things we love, we find ourselves becoming this arbiter of tidbit facts, discussing what the broader consensus has decided rather than what actually moves us. Notice how the cross and the doors and the clock are all off center. This is demonstrated earlier in the film when we glimpse Casey wrote repeating some facts to herself. Sardin's design is asymmetrical, yet still remains balanced. For me, uh, you know, for Casey's architecture, for me, it's cinema. And, you know, Casey has just fallen in love with it. And when you just fall in love with something, you know, and maybe you're not as sophisticated and you haven't intellectualized it yet and you create lists. Do you mind if I... For the tour? No. But if you start growing old to it, you can start almost getting cynical about even the conversation of it. And, and you can almost start having a distaste for it. And sometimes you need to reconnect with that love of it that uh, maybe, you know, uh, made you want to have your own list and made you want to talk about it in almost this sort of very innocent way. When analyzing films, it's important not to lose sight of what drew you to them in the first place, what effect they're having on you, and what you find moving. In this vein, I would like to discuss a scene in Columbus that moved me. This scene comes 44 minutes into the film, at a point when Casey takes Jin to see a building that is important to her. Come on. It's number three on my list. Number three, really? Here, Casey explains that she didn't know anything about architecture. For her, this is the building that started it all. It was the beginning for me, you know? This one here. The scene plays out from six points of coverage. We start in this sort of French over, then it's reversed. Please, tell me. <laughs> I need a cigarette. Then this flawlessly framed two shot over the car's roof. Can you pass me those? And finally, each character's close up. There's also this very interesting Brazon esque shot of Casey's hand. I think what jumped out to me was the way the scene buries the character's complex emotions deep beneath the surface. We get this joke from Casey early in the scene. You know, math is a big thing here. Math and modernism. Which leads to this exchange. Your mother? Did she do math? What? <laughs> Sorry. That just sounds funny. F funny how? <laughs> Your mother? Did she do math? The laughing and the banter completely <laughs> disarms us. You don't hear it? Hear what? Your mother? Did she do math? What? The back and forth that follows seems like a playful exchange. They're Did both laughing, so by the time we get to right. this moment... Did your mother do math? That was even worse. <laughs> it catches us by complete surprise. So she did. No, she did. We only cut to these close-ups when Casey reveals bits about herself, her mother's past addiction, and how it's prevented her from taking a potential opportunity to pursue architecture in New Haven. I really think I should stay with my mom. She's doing really well. We're happy. The way the scene is composed highlights how there are no grand revelations in this film. No climactic moment when all is won or lost. The scene's static framing mirrors the stillness we see throughout the majority of the film. Here, scenes of deep vulnerability are played with nuance, and the impact comes during the most unassuming scenes. You can really look at films in two ways. One, by examining the broader discussions around them, looking at them in an intellectual way, and finding meaning in the broader discourse. Or two, by exploring what a film means to you, how it moves you, and what makes you keep coming back to it. Neither way is wrong. 1950, yeah, so he was, he was definitely dead. Yes, 1950, the tour guide nails it. Like Casey, you can take the tour guide's theoretical approach into consideration while also valuing your own point of view, your own intellectual, emotional, and visceral reaction. When you see a particularly evocative piece of filmmaking, study it. Watch it back. Can you identify the filmmaker's inspirations, Ozu or perhaps Kubrick? Notice the effect it's having on you. This is the process through which you can make something that is wholly your own, which is definitely what Coconata has achieved here.